Okay, this is the last lecture of our first series, mini-series. And I decided based on feedback to talk about interconnects. There's again a lot more material than we can cover. And I'll probably cover less today because there's something going on downstairs. When does it end? Do you know? It's 4 p.m.? Or? Oh, that ends at 4 p.m.? So we'll try to end early. <laughs> but that may not happen. But feel free to ask questions again. This is another big area, interconnects. Uh, people have been fascinated with it. But there are a lot of interesting things that are happening right now uh, uh, on interconnects on chip uh, that are changing how we design interconnects. So this should be fun. OK, last lecture just to, can everybody see this from the back? It feels a little bit dark, but OK. <laughs> last lecture, we wrapped up asymmetric multi-core systems. We talked about how to handle private data locality, and we talked about how perhaps we can design systems that are much more power efficient as well as higher performance by specialization, customization, dynamically stitching together parts of the chip, asymmetric components. We also talked about a lot of uh, cache research uh, over, the, over the last few years. We, we first started with resource sharing and partitioning. What are the fundamental trade-offs between them? And then we talked about cache design for multi-core architectures and we discussed several ideas. Uh, how to incorporate costs of a cache mess into caching decisions, how to do better, much more efficient caching by trying to figure out what blocks are likely to be reused, of course, sit with simple mechanisms, uh, how to do cache compression more efficiently at low latency, low decompression latency, and how to partition the caches to maximize performance, maximize fairness, and without requiring any hardware support. And we've discussed the trade-offs of all of these different mechanisms, so it's, Hopefully you remember all of these. If you don't, uh, you can read the papers that were assigned. I'm assuming you've already done that, but maybe it was too nice of a weekend in terms of the, uh, the weather. OK, agenda for today. I'll, I intend to cover interconnect design for multi-core systems. I'll start with interconnect design in general. Uh, and we'll delve into some issues in multi-core systems. And I'll be biased again towards the research that we have been doing in the later parts of the course. And these are likely not going to be covered, especially since what, uh, we have something going on downstairs. OK. Well, I'll just skip these. But these are actually at the beginning of every lecture note so that you can uh, take, uh, easily go to things that you would like to look at. So I added a couple of readings, actually. These are the readings for today. Uh, I'm going to cover most of these, probably. Well, however, however we can get to. Most of these are related to efficient interconnection network design for on-chip networks. And some of them are related to more higher performance interconnection network design and quality of service on-chip. How do you uh, enable efficient quality of service on on-chip networks? Obviously, there are a lot of interesting uh, similarities and differences between on-chip and internet-like large-scale networks. And we've, been, we've covered that also recently in some papers. I'm not going to cover these papers, but if you're coming more from a networking background and not hardware chip design background, we have a paper in SIGCOM this last year that talks about uh, what are the differences uh, between many core interconnects as well as uh, off-chip internet-like interconnects in terms of congestion and scalability behavior. And we uh, cover buffering uh, choices uh, and uh, congestion control choices that look at uh, on-chip networks from a networking perspective. For example, one difference is uh, in, in internet-like networks, you get this behavior that's called congestion collapse. The network really collapses uh, when uh, there's too, ma too many nodes that are injecting a lot of load into the network. And you make very slow progress. Whereas in uh, on-chip networks, the, the behavior is uh, much more controlled because it's a smaller network. You can control. Uh, the injection to the network, so you don't need to collapse. Your latencies go up, but uh, you still make progress in an on-chip network. So that, that paper actually covers a lot of those issues, which I think is interesting to look at these different fields. Uh, well, different sub-areas within a field, maybe. <laughs> Depends on what you consider a field. OK, and these are the videos. Uh, and these are the videos for things and uh, readings for things that we're not going to cover. OK, let's start with the basics for interconnects. First of all, uh, if you look at um, a scalable multi-core system, there needs to be some sort of interconnect connecting these different components, right? That's, that's what an interconnect is. 
So it needs to be used to connect these shared caches that are distributed, uh, caches and cores, as well as uh, shared memory. So off chip, even off chip, you have an interconnect. Even a bus is an interconnect, right? It's a very simple interconnect. But where is the interconnect used? It is basically used to connect components. And there are many components that need to be connected, processors and processors, processors and memories, processors and caches, caches and caches, and I.O. devices and other uh, parts of the system. And we're going to abstract that as an interconnection network. In the most general form, you have an interconnection network that basically uh, where you can plug nodes into the network. And you don't care what node it is, as long as you satisfy the interface, where the interface is a router that connects the component to the network. And the component can be very different, right? Uh, so why is it important? This is important because it does affect the scalability of the system. If you do not have a scalable interconnection network, uh, you cannot build a very large system. And it also affects the ease of scalability of the system. How easily can you add more processors into the system without running into performance issues? Because every time you add a node, you probably add some latency and you may need more bandwidth. And if your network is not able to support that latency and bandwidth, you may not be able to design a scalable system. It also affects performance and increasingly energy efficiency uh, because uh, it affects how fast processors cache communicate, how long the latencies to memory are, how long the latencies of a coherence protocol are, and how much energy is spent on communication. Ideally, you would like to minimize communication, then this doesn't affect anything, but that's very tough to do if you want to solve big problems, you need to divide the problems into pieces. And you somehow need to get the data. That's communication. And you somehow need to communicate the data between processes, which we've talked about in the past lectures. And for that, you need a good network. Some basics. Uh, I, I just want to cover the basics so that we can go into the research issues. Topo there are three major things in an interconnection network. Topology, routing, and buffering and control flow that determine the network. And these are very tightly related, actually. Uh, topology is what the network looks like. Looks like I'm running out of batteries here, or my computer's spinning. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens. I may need to reboot. <laughs> no. Or is it, maybe it's just PowerPoint, as you can see. I can go into other things, but not PowerPoint. Let's see. Pause this. Sorry about that. <laughs> Microsoft PowerPoint is not responding. So if I force it to quit, I will lose unsaved changes, which may be OK. Maybe I'll do this. Is it this one? a big file. <laughs> OK. So let's, let's save this. It's actually probably an example of bad shared resource design and software. <laughs> More often than not, Microsoft has problems with bad shared resource uh, designs. You have a lock, and one process holds on to a lock, and it forgets to give it up. And you run into these spinning 
spin loops and it never gets out of that. <laughs> okay, let's see if this will work. But I'd like to record it also. Okay. Huh. <laughs> okay. This is better. What's interesting is that I suppose your rays will appear this time because we see orange. Oh, you see orange? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully. Let's see. If you go to the first slide, we can understand whether somewhere is orange or not. Okay. The first slide, yes. If you go up to the first slide, as far as I see, somewhere is yes. It's orange. It looks better. Yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> yes. But these are still red. Really? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> okay. Let's get back to topology. Okay. So topology specifies the way switches are wired, what the network looks like, and affects. Pretty much everything. It affects routing, reliability, throughput, latency, and building ease of the network. Uh, we'll cover some of, some of the topology soon. Routing, uh, we'll cover some of these also. It basically specifies how does a message get from source to destination. It could be static or adaptive, and we're, we're going to cover some of the schemes. And buffering and flow control, basically uh, it uh, affects a lot of things also. What do, it's basically uh, answering the question, what do we store within the network and how do we store it? Do we store entire packets, parts of packets? And how do we throttle during over subscription? Basically, how do we control the flow of packets in the network? That's what flow control means. And these are, again, tightly coupled. And we're going to cover a lot of issues related to this. OK, this is also especially tightly coupled with the routing strategy. But obviously, topology affects the flow control as well. Again, these, are, uh, these, are, these issues exist in large-scale networks also. So these are very fundamental and interesting. Uh, so it's good to know a lot of these topics, I think. How many of you have taken networks courses? OK, maybe half, <laughs> half of the class. Okay. Have you covered the topologies, different network topologies? OK, I'll try to go quickly then. So we'll cover some topologies, not all of them, but I think this is a fun Thing to talk about. Uh, so if you look at the topologies, bus is the simplest topology and point-to-point -point connections are the ideal and most costly topologies. And people have developed many different topologies to approximate point-to-point -point connections without the cost of it. So there are several metrics to evaluate interconnect topology. Cost is a big one. Latency is another one. Uh, and latency can be in hops or in nanoseconds and they're not the same. Uh, because you may have a very long hop, and that could take a very long time, especially given that our interconnect latencies are not scaling very well in VLSI today. Uh, and contention also uh, is another metric. And there are many others that exist that you should think about. I'm not going to cover a lot of these. I'm going to evaluate many topologies based on this in the next few, uh, in the next hour, I think. Uh, energy, bandwidth, and overall system performance. And we're going to come back to energy and overall system performance later on. OK. Today my PowerPoint requires a lot of attention. <laughs> OK, bus is a very simple topology. Basically, you have a bunch of nodes, and they're connected via this bus uh, to each other. Another example is here. You have a bunch of caches that are connected via a bus to different memory banks. OK. <laughs> so this is the advantage of this is simple. And it's cost effective for a small number of nodes. And it's easy to implement coherence on this because everybody sees everybody else's actions, right? Every cache sees every other cache's actions. Seems like I need to keep clicking. <laughs> uh, it's cost effective for a small number of nodes, uh, but as you increase the number of nodes, this doesn't scale very well. Because as you scale the number of nodes, as you keep adding things, you have limited bandwidth. When one node is transferring, if the other node also needs to transfer, it cannot, because there is only single bus. You can pipeline the bus, you still limit the bandwidth. Uh, so there are two reasons why it's not scalable. First, uh, 
when there's high contention, many number of nodes that need to inject, you get to saturation quickly because they all need to serialize over this bus. And the second reason for, uh, not, uh, for this topology not being scalable is because of electrical load loading. As you add more nodes, you load the bus electrically, so you'll have to operate at a reduced frequency. As a result, your bandwidth reduces. So people have moved away from buses, uh, although hierarchical buses could be an interesting topology going forward, and people have been looking at that. IBM has many designs that have hierarchical buses, uh, not even rings. Uh, so that's, uh, that's interesting to look at. But fundamentally, it's not a scalable topology unless you, do some, uh, you build some hierarchy on top of it. On the opposite extreme, you can connect every node point to point to every other node. That's what this looks like. Basically, you connect node 0 to every other node, node 1 to every other node, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 to every other node, and this is what the network looks like. And you can see that it's very complicated. Uh, the upside is there's lowest contention. When one node is communicating with another, it can use its own private channel. Uh, there, there is no contention between the communication of uh, pairs of nodes. There is only contention within uh, the communication of pair, uh, the same pair. Uh, Potentially, it could be lowest latency if you can design these wires to be nice and long enough, uh, nice and short enough. And ideally, uh, this is an ideal network if cost is not an issue, right? And if, if you can satisfy this part, right? The downside is not scalable for this reason because cost is always an issue, right? And whenever people build systems and they say cost is not an issue, you should never believe them. <laughs> Because people actually used to do that with supercomputers, for example. They, they, they used to think that cost is not an issue, but even supercomputer companies like Cray are very much cost limited. They may be less cost limited, but co they're still cost limited. That's why en engineering is an exciting field, right? We solve problems to minimize the cost. So this is highest cost because you have o order of n connections, ports per node, and order of n square links. And also, there are a lot of issues related to the layout of this. Like, if, as you scale the number of nodes, how, how will you route this uh, network? Yeah, as a result, it's not scalable. Crossbar is uh, a step below this one. Instead of connecting things point to point, every node is connected to every other, except one, only one can be using the connection at a given time. Basically, it looks like this. Uh, this way, you enable concurrent message sends to non-conflicting destinations. So if, so, uh, this node 7 can communicate with memory bank 6, for example, while node 6 is communicating with memory bank 5. There's no contention there. The only contention happens when two nodes are sending a message to, one, to a single destination. So there needs to be some arbitration there. And this is good for a small number of nodes, again, because it's costly. Right? If you look at the cost, it's ON square. Uh, this is low latency and high throughput. That's the advantage compared to bus. Uh, but it's expensive because of this. Uh, and it's difficult to arbitrate as n actually increases. And I'll show you some uh, examples of this. Uh, this is used in core to cache bank networks in many processors uh, that were initially designed. The processors that we've covered, IBM Power 5 and Niagara, had this kind of network. Uh, so this is one crossbar design. Uh, if you look at this, mm, you'll see the arbitration problem, right? You need to, you can enable only one of these nodes to be connected to the destination node. So how do you arbitrate between these as n increases? Becomes a problem. So UltraSpark has a crossbar like this. It has cores on this side. It has cache banks on this side and a non-cacheable unit, which is a network uh, as a ninth uh, destination. So basically, they have a, a, an interface between eight cores and eight L2 banks and the non-cacheable unit. And there is a crossbar that's connecting both. And this is what the crossbar looks like. Basically, this is a crossbar that connects all of the cores to bank zero. And if you look at this, there's some buffering. And this is the arbiter, which uh, consists of a bunch of muxes. Right? Uh, it's a four-stage pipeline. You request, you arbitrate, and the arbiter selects. And in the next cycle, uh, the transmission happens. So this is basically a router, if you will, that routes the messages coming from different cores to one destination. Mm. And they decided to put two deep queues so that they can ease the arbitration. Okay? So this becomes costly as you increase the size of the uh, network. So this is a 
bufferless crossbar. If you look at this, it says buffered crossbar, but we'll build a bufferless crossbar soon. This is a bufferless crossbar, and arbitration of bufferless crossbar is actually more complicated because you don't know, uh, you somehow need to directly connect uh, these network interfaces and somehow need to arbitrate between them. Whereas if you have a buffered crossbar, what you can do is you can do the arbitration at the output uh, over here. Right. Basically, all of these um, uh, channels, if you will, arbitrate for the output. And you can uh, use flow control such that you can uh, ensure that the buffers are not oversubscribed. Okay? I'm going through this very quickly because these are basic concepts. You can learn more about the design of the buffered crossbar later on. We're going to go into buffering uh, choices very soon in a generic router, not necessarily a crossbar, but more of a uh, generic router that does routing, a generic switch, if you will. Okay, so with buffering, actually, you get simpler arbitration. We're going to cover this again. Uh, we'll, we'll see that there, there uh, you can actually get a simpler arbiter with a bufferless or minimally buffered router also. Uh, you can have efficient support for variable size packets this way because now you can arbitrate, you can prioritize a variable size packet here, whereas it may be difficult to do in a bufferless way. But this requires n square buffers again. And that's, uh, keep this in mind because this is going to be a big cost of an on-chip network. Buffering may not be a big problem in an off-chip off -chip network and certainly not in a software network. Although it is still a problem, but it's less of a problem, but as you add buffers, they consume a lot of area and power in an on-chip network. As well as this flow control mechanisms, they consume a lot of area and power. Okay, so people have asked this uh, question for a long time. Can we get lower cost than a crossbar, yet still have low contention? So the idea of multi-stage networks have been developed uh, for more than 40 years now. Uh, the idea of a multi-stage network is basically you have an indirect network what it means is you have multiple layers of switches between uh, communicating nodes. You have some uh, source nodes and destination nodes, and you have a bunch of switches. The whole purpose of these switches are just to route the data. They're not nodes themselves. Uh, that's why this is called an indirect network. There's no direct communication. If you look at a crossbar, it's direct, right? There is no separate switch. If you look at this, the, the whole purpose of this is just switching. It's like a telephone network. You have switches that just switch and you, don't, you cannot call a switch in the telephone network, right? You have to call the destination. Uh, so the cost, if you look at this, is an omega, omega network uh, and there are a bunch of these and again, I'm not going to go into detail. This is uh, a symmetric one. If you look at this, some of these are not symmetric. But uh, the, the cost of this is O n log n. Uh, and the latency is log n, basically n, uh, if, if you look at this, there are three stages here. And you have eight nodes, and n is the number of nodes. Uh, there are many variations, uh, this is one of them. The trade-off these networks make is, uh, now, uh, even for destinations that uh, are not the same, you can get conflicts. So if you look at this, if this source needs to send uh, to this destination, it needs to go through this route, right? But if some other source is sending to some other destination, you can still get a conflict because they need to go through this switch together. And that's a conflict that doesn't happen in a crossbar. And that's why you reduce the cost, but at the, the downside is you get more contention. Then the question is actually how do you wire these switches? You, get, uh, you reduce the contention by wiring these switches intelligently, and people have studied this for a long time. And if you're interested in this, this is a very exciting topic. It's, uh, I wouldn't suggest doing research on it because <laughs> it's probably got, uh, saturated quite a bit. But I think mm, it's good to understand these uh, going forward in building uh, systems. So multi-stage networks, uh, another, another topic is circuit switching versus packet switching. A multi-stage network can be circuit switched, right? Uh, meaning that you first set up the path uh, between the source and destination and only that source destination pair can use that path and nothing else can use that path until that path is broken down or teared down. Uh, this places more restrictions on feasible concurrent trans, uh, uh, transaction pairs, uh, to source and destination pairs, transmitter receiver pairs. Uh, so what is the advantage of circuit switching? Because you set up the path, you don't really need a crossbar, right? You don't need, really need to dynamically arbitrate. Whenever, uh, uh, whenever a packet comes here, 
This switch is already set up to be wired directly. It's reconfigured, if you will. So there, there doesn't need to be a dynamic arbitration. This is more statically arbitrated early on. Statically meaning before the connection happens. Make sense? So uh, the router is much simpler in this case. You just reconfigure. Uh, so it's more scalable than crossbar in cost. Uh, that's the, uh, well, that's the multi-stage part. The, but it's more scalable. It's a more scalable switch also if you actually do it circuit switched. You could also do it packet switched. Now you don't set up the uh, path early on. If you're communicating between 0 and 7, for example, you don't set up and dedicate that path early on. But you say, I'm going to allow all kinds of connections to be concurrent at any given time. For this, you need uh, dynamically switched routers. Basically, the routers need to be able to dynamically connect any input to any output. And that complicates the router design here. The previous router design, it's simpler. And it doesn't need to be buffered also. Actually, if you have circuit switching, you don't need to have buffers in your router. You can arbitrate early on. But packet switch is much more general, right? Because packet switch allows uh, these two nodes to connect through this uh, switch, whereas circuit switching allows only one of them uh, to stand at, a, at any given time. OK. So just as an aside, circuit switching sets up the full path and uses that path uh, through those routers beforehand. First, you establish the route and send the data. No one else can use those links while the path is established. Whereas packet switching uh, routes each packet individually, possibly via different paths. If the link is free, any packet can use it, so it's more flexible. This leads to faster arbitration, simpler router, hopefully. The downside is handshake, right? This is more like uh, you have to set up, the, set up and bring down the links first, and that needs to happen. There needs to be arbitration beforehand, uh, whereas there's, there's no per packet arbitration. Here, packet switching is potentially slower because the router must dynamically switch, but there's no setup and bring down time. Uh, but this is more flexible. It doesn't underutilize the links. In circuit switching, when one node is not transferring data through a router, even though it's already set up the path, if another node uh, needs to can use if another node actually can use that router or would like to use that router, it cannot because the path is already reserved for someone else. So this is uh, the choice of circuit and packet switching is independent of topology. It's actually a higher level protocol on how a message, message gets delivered to its destination, right? But it still does affect the choices of the router, how you design the router. Yes? There was one problem with the previous slide. OK. Dependent switching. Uh, when you have to switch your data, the invites come from different pet paths. Mm -hmm. So you have to spend some time for synchronization of the data. So this is the main drawback of the pet switch, switching network for launch networks. So this one, right? But yes. it's potentially slower mm -hmm. because you need to, you can have different. Yeah, uh, for mm -hmm. this, you can just switch your data. There's no problem. This, mm -hmm. The actual doing dynamic switching, you have to take some decision. That's right. Yes, but however, at the target, at the uh, destination, you have to reorganize your data so as to obtain the complete data as, a, uh, as desired. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the data reorganization at the, uh, at the receiver part also takes some that, that's true, that's true, yes. Because with circuit switching, you know which, uh, who you are receiving from. And that, uh, that, uh, you, don't, you don't need to reorganize your data. Yes. We'll, we'll cover that problem later on. You're right. I, I, I wasn't exhaustive in, in the list of things that are here. But you're absolutely right. OK, so this is actually uh, a higher level protocol. And people have proposed protocols for internet also, right? for circuit switching versus packet switching. ATM is a circuit switched uh, network, for example. Uh, but uh, some topologies are more amenable to circuit versus packet switching. And we may get back to this. OK, another example. This is actually one of the earlier examples uh, from uh, Janak Patel in ISCA 1979. This is a beautiful paper to read, by the way. This is one of the earlier examples of multi-stage networks, uh, maybe the first example. Uh, basically, it shows a single path from source to destination. It's different from the Omega network because it doesn't support all possible permutations here. It's, it's, it was again proposed to replace costly crossbars as processor memory interconnect. At that time, people were trying to design how can we connect a large number of processors to a large number of memories in a scalable way. So this was for off-chip networks. And this was the solution. 
With on-chip networks, we'll see that the designs are a little bit different. But I'll let you study the, if you, if you look at this, it's actually not symmetric. <laughs> it's, okay, another, well, this is the Omega network, which is more symmetric. All stages are the same. Here, all stages are not the same uh, because of the way things are connected. Uh, Omega network, uh, this was in the NYU Ultra computer, uh, which was uh, one of the more interesting uh, parallel machines of its time. Basically, you have single path from source to destination, and all stages are the same. Uh, and if, uh, I've already shown you this, but one interesting thing they had employed in this computer was uh, combining operations. So you could actually have routers perform computation also. So it was not just a switch, but uh, you could, for example, add uh, numbers. And one, one, one primitive they've introduced is the idea of fetch and add. So if you would like to, for example, uh, increment, if you were doing barrier synchronization, and if all processors reach the barrier at the same time, and if you want to increment a shared data value, you don't need to, uh, all processors don't need to fetch the data value uh, to uh, their nodes, but they can issue fetch and add operations. What fetch and add operation does is it says, uh, fetch and add this location A, which is the lock that's uh, protecting the barrier. Uh, and the idea is if all processors reach that, they will all somehow uh, go through a router that uh, receives these fetch and add messages. And the uh, router can aggregate those fetch and add messages. Let's say this processor 000 and 001 both want to, or let's say 000 and 011 both want to increment uh, a memory location A. Router had some logic in it that says, oh, 000 is sending a message fetch and add location A, and 0010 is also sending a message fetch and add location A. So I'm going to combine these messages and say fetch and add location A by twice. So they had this interesting logic that simplified a lot of these synchronization operations or work distribution operations in their parallel machine. And this is an interesting paper to read uh, from that point of view. I'd recommend that. Okay, so let's take a look at the other side. So this, is, this was, we're trying to simplify the network but you can also go simpler from the other side. You can start with a bus and make it uh, a little bit more complicated, right? And that brings you to a ring. Uh, these are, again, uh, switches here. We have processors and memory. Basically, a ring looks like this. You connect everything uh, as a ring. This is cheap, right? The cost is ON in this case. You, you have point-to-point -point connections between neighboring nodes on the ring. It's, the downside is it's high latency, right? If you want to communicate between one node to another, it can, it's order n. It could be one, uh, one hop, but it, it could be n divided by two hops also. Actually, if you have a single uh, uh, ring, if, uh, if you have a unidirectional ring, it could actually be n hops, right? n minus one hops. And this is also not easy, easy to scale. Uh, one uh, metric uh, I will not discuss, but one metric that, uh, that actually is used to evaluate uh, networks has been bisection bandwidth. You cut the ne network uh, at a place where you have the most bandwidth, and this is called the bisection bandwidth, and that's the uh, bandwidth of the network. Uh, this remains constant as you keep adding nodes, which means that you're not, if, as you add nodes, you're not increasing the bandwidth in the network. So contention increases as a result, assuming the communication also scales uh, as you add nodes. So this is actually used in many uh, systems today, uh, Intel, uh, late, latest products, as well as past products, or uh, this is actually Knight's Corner right now, I think, uh, or Xeon Phi, it used to be Larrabee. But past products use rings because they're simple. They're simple to implement. IBM Cell had a ring also. So many commercial systems use rings to co connect caches, different from uh, the crossbars that were in IBM Power 5 and Niagara. Okay. Okay, so a unidirectional ring. The advantage, uh, one advantage of the ring is the router is very simple. If you look at the router, uh, this is what it looks like. There's uh, routing logic uh, to inject into the ring, and there's logic to eject from the ring into the node. And that's all you need. It's a two by two router. Uh, the topology is simple. Implementation is simple. And you get reasonable performance if n number of nodes 
and performance needs are relatively low. So if you can actually localize your communication really well, so this may be a good uh, network, but it's not a very general purpose network perhaps. So you get ON costs as opposed to N log N and N squared that we've seen. And you get N divided by two average hops and latency depends on the utilization. Right? So you can make this bi-directional ring, of course. In this case, it's just unidirectional. You can have bi-directional. You can have two directions. This reduces latency and improves scalability, but it's slightly more complex. So it, it makes sense, actually, to make things bi-directional because you can control things at the injection. You decide which direction uh, to inject into in each node. You can also make things more hierarchical, and I think this uh, becomes more interesting with rings especially. Now you have a ring that's localized here, and you have a bunch of rings that are localized, and you can have a ring that are just connecting those rings. Right? So now if you want to communicate within this ring, the communication is simple. It, it's a bi-directional ring. If you want to communicate from this ring to this other ring, now uh, you need to send a message that hops into this ring and delivers the message here. Right? So this becomes uh, an interesting and more scalable topology, I think, as you go forward. And you can add more bridge routers if you want to scale this. So it turns out this, if there's a lot of communication across rings, you would like to scale this global middle ring. And how do you scale that global middle ring? By adding more taps as to where it can tap into uh, the local rings. And this is the most complicated one. This is still 16 nodes, but you have a more complicated two global rings that are connecting uh, the local rings. Uh, and this is a three level uh, hierarchy that has 64 nodes, if you will. So this is actually an interesting topic. I'd be happy to talk about <laughs> this with people. This is a direction that we've been looking at so that we don't need to have complicated routers uh, in, in on-chip networks. So if you look at this, this is more scalable, it's lower latency, and obviously it's more complex. But the upside is routers themselves do not get significantly more complex. The topology gets complex, but the routers are still simple. It's just two by two routers. And if you want to learn more about it, uh, this is a submission we have to Micro right now that talks about the design choices in, a, in an interconnect like this. Yes? The reliability becomes a problem in ring networks. I mean, if a node, in a simple ring, if a node goes down, you basically lost connection, right, from one half of the network. That's right. That's um, because you, do, you don't have a lot of path diversity, right? The, you, you go through one node to reach another node. So that's right. But if you, if you design, hopefully, the, uh, the, the router, uh, the simple router to be more reliable, maybe you, you can trade off uh, that. It's harder to design a more complex router to be reliable, whereas it may be easier to design a simpler router more reliable to be more reliable. Or you use double rings. I mean, those are things done in networks. I mean, That's right. You use double rings and you heal them. Right? That's right, exactly. You could, you, could, you, could, you could use all of those tricks to make this uh, more reliable. Maybe I have heard of wheels. So have you compared your work with the wheel? Um, wheel, that is wheel. In wheel, you have, uh, instead of four nodes, the same ring, you have, I suppose, eight nodes. Mm -hmm. And they are connected to one central also. Okay. So, have you your so we have not looked at that. Yeah, that there are a bunch of topologies. I So we have looked at the work, but we haven't compared directly. But be, I think it's a good idea to continue looking at this. Mm -hmm. Because they have, I suppose, just one cross, mm -hmm. they are just connecting one wheel to at the end of each, mm -hmm. uh, part, at, the, at the end of the cross, each, part, uh, each cross, then at each point they have eight nodes. Okay, so we have looked at networks with eight nodes mm -hmm. in the ring, and it's not too bad. The scalability is still okay with eight nodes. Mm -hmm. But I think a wheel certainly adds more scalability mm -hmm. uh, if you have a lot of communication, especially within a single ring. It would be good to look at that, I agree. <laughs> Did you have a question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are other mixed topologies, of course. That's right. Yeah. Rings, you have like two connected cycles and mm -hmm. things like that. You can combine rings with the uh, two, Q. Uh, which reliability will be uh, better, of course, because mm -hmm. of that Q uh, connecting the rings. That's right, yes. Uh, all kind of composite. Yes, I agree. 
<laughs> I agree. I think <laughs> it's actually fun to think about a lot of these topologies, and <laughs> there are a lot of issues related to reliability, performance. Uh, I just want to point this out as a hierarchical topology. I think the key thing going forward in many core systems is that we want to keep the router to be simple. That's, maybe that's my bias, but if your routers are very complex, they're consuming a lot of power. So to any topology, as you said, that keeps the router simple and becomes more hierarchical, combines things such that you get good latency would be very interesting going forward. And reliability is another issue that is usually not fully tackled when you look at topology research, at, at least in combination with everything else. Okay, so I'd be interested in your opinion about uh, this and others. Uh, there are other reli uh, hierarchical topologies also. People have looked at hierarchical meshes, for example, meshes of meshes, and I guess meshes of buses, and buses, and buses of buses. But <laughs> that's right, lots of hybrid topologies. You could, you could be very creative here. <laughs> Okay, so mesh, I've just uh, discussed. Mesh basically looks like this. So every, uh, it's a two-dimensional network that looks like this, and uh, each node is connected to its immediate four neighbors, north, south, east, west. And average latency is, uh, it's all n cost again, in terms of the links, and average latency is square root of n, uh, order of square root of n. So people have looked at meshes a lot, especially recently for on-chip networks, because this is easy to lay out on-chip. If you look at this, you just build this node and you stamp it out. It's like a ring, except it's more scalable potentially, right? Because you have regular and equal length links here. And you have path diversity, uh, a little bit different from a single ring at least. There are many ways to get from one node to another. So if one node breaks down, or if one router breaks down, if one link breaks down, you can use that other ring. This also helps contention, of course, because you can communicate between many different nodes without utilizing uh, uh, the, the links. There, there aren't many common links, basically. Or there are many uncommon links between two different uh, destination pairs, source destination pairs. So this is used in, uh, I guess, a commercial product, Hilera's 100-core chip which has very wimpy cores, if you remember our discussion from two lectures ago. Very wimpy cores and they're connected via the scalable interconnection network. Actually, you could argue that their interconnection network is more powerful than the cores themselves because they have five different interconnection networks. Uh, and many, many different on-chip network prototypes also. Intel uh, has prototypes uh, this way. I think they called it the single chip cloud computer, SCC. That figure, what's this? So each of those are a node and the circle is? Uh, so the circle is the node, uh, this is the router. Oh. And we'll, we'll cover this in a little bit more detail. Yeah, circle is the node itself and this is the router that connects four uh, uh, north, south, east, west neighbors uh, of the node. We'll cover this in a little bit more detail. This is just pictorial right now. So meshes, one downside of meshes, if you want to communicate from this node to this node, well, you need to go all the way this way, right? But if you had a connection like this that wraps around, now you're much more symmetric. So th the problem is the edge, edge nodes are not symmetric in a mesh. Uh, be because of this, performance becomes very sensitive to placement of the task. If you place a task over here, it has very, uh, very few places to communicate. If you basically uh, held the bandwidth. Uh, it's communication bandwidth, whereas if you place the task here, its bandwidth is much higher, right? However, in course, it's always important that the uh, path from one end to the other end is also a very long path, compared to yes. the short paths between the uh, <laughs> two neighbors in the mesh. Mm -hmm. The one in the right-hand side is, the, is very long yes. uh, to go to the, to go to the uh, node, well, we'll get back to that on the next slide. <laughs> it, looks, it, it looks very long, but you can actually view the nodes. You can actually make the nodes equal length, almost equal length. I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you with an example. So this is, this is a logical view, but physically you won't lay, lay it out this way. You'll actually view the, view the nodes. <laughs> okay, so Taurus avoids this problem by adding those paths that uh, you just mentioned. The upside is, again, higher path diversity. And you get higher bisection bandwidth. Now, if you cut the mesh in the middle, you get some bandwidth, but you don't have these additional, uh, well, these additional connections. Now you have these two additional or many additional connections that improve your bisection uh, bi bandwidth. 
ups, downside is higher, higher cost, and it's harder to lay out, as you mentioned, because you have unequal link lengths. Although you could lay it out this way, <laughs> which actually it's still harder to lay out than a mesh because you need to go, uh, you need to build the wires on top of each other, whereas mesh is nice and beautiful. But it's at least you get rid of the unequal uh, link widths. And I'll let you think about this. This requires some thinking, I think, that uh, to convince yourself that this is actually a torus, but it is actually a torus. <laughs> this kind of routing, yes. You, you, you know that better, probably, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but torus can be a more scalable topology also, especially if you have more metal layers, right? You can, the routing is not that bad. Okay, so trees are, uh, maybe a little bit more scalable, but these are becoming more specialized to the communication pattern also. If you look at this, a tree looks like this. It's a planar hierarchical topology by nature. Uh, and ignore this fatness for now, but assume that this is a tree, this is a binary tree. And these are the nodes, and they can communicate with each other somehow. If you look at this, la uh, this the latency is O log n, right? You need to, uh, communicates, uh, the latent scales with the log of the number of nodes. This is good for local traffic. If these nodes are communicating with each other, they, they don't need to go all the way to the other side, right? So if you come very nicely to this tree, you can get much better performance than a mesh, if you will. Uh, and this is actually, um, we can actually, we already know how to design trees, right? A clock is a tree in a network, and that's a network too, uh, in, when you lay out, a, when you design a chip. And we know that very well. We, people have optimized those designs. So we can perhaps optimize this design also. Uh, so the upside is it's cheap, O-N, and it's easy to lay out also. And we know how to do that today. Uh, the downside is uh, not all communication patterns fit nicely to this. And root can actually become a bottleneck. Well, here you don't see the root, but you, can, you have two roots connecting the top of the trees. Uh, and fat trees actually avoid this problem. The idea of a fat tree is as you keep going up the tree, you keep the total bisection bandwidth constant. Meaning that in a binary tree, you double the bandwidth over here. As you keep going up, you keep doubling the bandwidth. And this is a fat tree. This, this part becomes very fat because the bandwidth is very high over here. The assumption is that if the communication is uniform, you get uh, this, become, this doesn't become a bottleneck anymore because the bandwidth is high. And these have been used in supercomputers. Connection Machine uh, 5, which is another interesting paper. This is, the, this is their FAT3. Uh, and uh, they've used uh, FAT3 as a communication uh, substrate uh, in their uh, designs. They had basically these 4x2 uh, switches. And they had an inter interesting randomized routing mechanism uh, going uh, from uh, bottom to up. And I'll let you think about, uh, I'll let you read this interesting uh, technical summary. We won't go into detail. But they've actually used, this was a machine, uh, this was a SIMD machine. This had, they had 64,000 processing elements, I think. And they connected them this way. And they had a lot of operations, combining operations. These switches actually did combining that I described earlier. They had support for multicast. And they had uh, support for reduction operators also. So my, my favorite example for trees is if you want to do a very large scale addition of elements in a network, basically you can do the sums going up and you can uh, sum up everything. Uh, you can do the partial sums and you can propagate the partial sums and you can do the next level sums and you can do the next level sums all the way up at such that you have the final sum over here if you keep your initial elements uh, in the bottom of the tree. That makes sense. That's a, be that's a beautiful communication that fits the per uh, network, right? OK. So you can go even more fancy hypercubes that <laughs> you mentioned earlier, uh, or cubes in general, uh, is an interesting topology. And I think this will be the last topology that I'll just throw at you. Uh, basically, uh, this is what it looks like. It's a hypercube. Uh, and I assume you're familiar with hypercubes. It's a cube, right? This is a 3D. Cube and this is the 4D version and this is the 5D version, I think. Or maybe this is the 4D version still. So latency here is O log N again. It scales with the log uh, of the network. Radix, Radix is basically how many outputs and inputs the uh, router has. Uh, that's again O log N and the number of links is O N log N. 
And again, uh, you can map your uh, computation nicely to this such that local uh, computation, local communication, uh, communication is localized so that you don't need to use those links. But the distances are not too bad. So people have actually designed this as well. This is again another beautiful paper for one of the early message passing supercomputers, the Cosmic Cube from Caltech. Uh, it was a 64 node message passing machine and it looked like this basically, I think. And, uh, and it, it doesn't look that bad but they, it was laid out like this. So you can actually connect things nicely even though they may look bad over here. Okay, I'll recommend this paper also. Uh, there, there are a lot of things in this paper that talk about message passing computers and how you actually uh, design parallel programs for a message passing machine like this uh, and why they did the network like this. So I'll let you read that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at some issues that are interesting in on-chip networks now. One issue that comes up a lot is how do you handle contention? Because as you, ideally you would like a network that's really cheap but also can support a lot of uh, bandwidth and performance. Right? One issue in a router is how do you actually handle the contention when two packets are trying to use the same link at the same time and this doesn't come out very well. But th this packet is trying to come from here and go to this link. This packet is trying to come from here and go to this link. What do you do? There are actually three fundamental ways of doing, handling this I think. One is you can buffer one of them. Uh, you can drop one of them, right? or you can misroute one of them. Misroute meaning send one of them to uh, a destination it doesn't want to go to. Right? And I think these uh, decisions uh, have been overwhelmingly considered for uh, the first one. Like people have looked at buffering a lot, but people haven't explored uh, these options a lot, even though they're as old as buffering options in the past. But as we go into mm, more energy efficient networks, as we need more energy efficient networks, we should probably be exploring some of these different design choices as we go forward. So I'll talk a little bit about the research that we've been doing in this area. So as long as you have a mechanism to retransmit, yes. dropping is not bad, so, right? So you have to just signal outlets, I have dropped the packets, so the that's right, yeah, this is like, uh, similar to some protocols in internet, like transmission control protocol, where you drop packets and somehow the sender figures out the packet is dropped and uh, it resends the packet. You could, you could have that sort of protocol here. Misshouting is also problematic and we'll see some issues related to that. Buffering is the safest, yes. but it's the most expensive also. Right? Because now your router needs to deal with buffers and it needs to arbitrate between the buffers. Uh, these others may be simpler, right? And we'll take a look at that. So we'll, actually, I'll just give you the basic idea, but we'll come back to this again. So in deflection routing, this is a very old idea. Uh, this is a, another seminal paper by Paul Boran from Rand Corporation in, in 1962. Uh, he, he looked at a lot of issues in distributed communication networks at the time, and he introduced uh, this idea, which he called hot potato routing. Basically, whenever you have a, uh, two packets that are trying to use the same output port in a router, uh, treat, uh, don't buffer the packets, but uh, deflect one of them uh, to a, des a, a, node, a destination that it doesn't want to go to. So you can think of a packet like a hot potato. Nobody wants to hold it. It's too hot. <laughs> routers are trying to hold it, but the routers are always passing the packet to some other, some other router. So let me just uh, demonstrate this. You have these two and this is red again. <laughs> you have these two packets that are trying to go to a destination and this is the destination and uh, obviously the shortest path from this pack th here to here is this way if you're doing XY routing. XY means you go through X direction first and then Y direction next uh, and shortest path from here to here is this way. You don't need to go anywhere in the X direction right? because they're in the same uh, X uh, coordinate. So in the first cycle, these two packets arrive at this router. Now they both need to go to the same direction, right? So what does deflection routing do? Normally you would buffer one of them. What does deflection routing do? It says red packet, you can take your destination, but blue packet, too bad, I don't have a buffer. I'm go and you're too hot, I'm gonna pass you on to this router that's uh, to my right. And that's what happens. 
this blue packet takes the longer, more scenic route, if you will. And it eventually arrives at its destination. Right? So that's the idea. And new traffic in this case can be injected whenever there's a free output link. So if you look at the, uh, a router, if, if a node here, if it's trying to inject a packet, if all of its output links are busy, it cannot inject that packet. That's the idea. So we're going to re-examine this choice for on-chip interconnects uh, soon. Uh, many uh, So actually, people have looked at this in when they were building the internet. Should we build actually internet-like or distributed networks uh, in a more bufferless fashion? And they figured out that the load is too high. Load would likely be very high in a network like this, uh, such that buffering uh, is necessary. So if you think of buffering, what it adds is it adds more uh, capability to handle load into the network. Whereas if you're bufferless, if you do not have any buffers in the network, you cannot keep more packets in your network. Right? You can think of your links as the buffers. Only your links are the buffers. And the pipeline latches, of course. I'm assuming that pipeline latches are still there if you're pipeline the network. They're, they're different from buffers. The router itself has buffers to keep uh, packets. OK, we'll get back to this and we'll take a look at actually how this potentially simplifies things and also complicates things. And can we achieve uh, a good place uh, in, uh, in the spectrum between bufferless and buffered uh, router design? So if you look at the uh, buffer, buffered router, that's what it looks like. This is, you get inputs from uh, different sides, north, south, east, west, and also the local port. And this is a mesh router. It's a two-dimensional mesh. Uh, and you get outputs uh, to north, south, east, east, west, and local also. And you need, a, you need to have a five, five by five crossbar here. Uh, and I'm not going to cover a lot of the crossbar designs, but that's, that in itself is a, a topic that people have explored a lot also. And you have these input buffers. Uh, and basically, these are the buffers that are coming from the north direction. And you need to arbitrate for this crossbar. If two things need to go north, you need to figure out which ones actually go north and you need to buffer the packets and do the arbitration. And that becomes hard to scale. If you, if you keep adding buffers, uh, the size of this becomes hard to scale. And we'll see some results in terms of uh, what is the energy overhead of this buff these buffers. Whereas if you have, uh, basically, in bufferless routing, flits are buffered in pipeline latches and network links. So if you have a pipeline latch here, they're buffered here. But I'm not showing that. But you need to have some deflection routing logic. And we'll see how complicated it gets. There are a lot of inter interesting issues, actually, in the design of this. But before we go into that, let's take a look at some routing algorithms also. There are three types of routing algorithms in general. One is deterministic. This always chooses the same path for a communicating source-destination pair. If your source and destination are the same, you always go through the same path. XY routing that I described earlier is deterministic, right? You always go through x direction first and y direction next. You could do yx routing also. Oblivious routing, you can choose different paths between the same source and destination pair, but you don't consider the network state. For example, you can randomly choose a different path. Adaptive routing, you can, still, you can choose different paths again, but you can adapt to the network state. And these get more complicated as you go down. Uh, then the question is, how do you do adaptation? Do you do local and global feedback? Do you actually use minimal adaptive routing, because if you have many paths, all pa many, many of those paths can be minimal. Minimal in the sense that they minimize the number of hops or number of seconds it takes to communicate. But you can also do non-minimal routing. right? And deflection routing is a non-minimal routing mechanism because you can take the longer route. right? So let's take a look at some of these, because I think these are also interesting. These are uh, topics that people are researching in on-chip networks. Uh, as I said, all packets between the same source and destination pair take the same path in deterministic routing. Dimension order routing, XY routing, which is actually used in many on-chip network prototypes today. And I think it was first used commercially in the, in the Cray products, uh, T3D. You do this. Uh, it's simple. It's deadlock free. If you have buffers, uh, you need to handle an issue called deadlock. We'll, we'll look at it very briefly because there are no cycles in resource allocation. Deadlock is whenever uh, two things are waiting on each other and they keep waiting forever. Right? Uh, and we'll see why this is deadlock free. And this could actually lead to high contention. That's the downside. right? You may have very nice path diversity in a 
uh, mesh, but uh, you're not really exploiting that path diversity if you do this, right? So let's say this is your mesh. And these are your nodes. If you do expire routing, and let's say this node is communicating with this one, this node is with this one, this node with this one, and this node with this one, they all need to route through this direction, right? And they contend with each other. Whereas if you exploit path diversity, they, they can route through different directions. But then you, you should not be deterministic, perhaps. Or you, you become more complicated deterministic. But then if, you, if you're deterministic, you cannot adapt to some other communication pattern. That's the downside. So that's why adaptive routing is usually better for performance. Because this doesn't exploit path diversity. OK, so what is deadlock? This is an issue with, yes? Oh, one minute? OK. Yeah, maybe you should change it right now. This 